Well, good morning, Broadway Church family. Welcome, visitors and guests. We are so glad that you are joining us today digitally. Of course, we are not meeting publicly and corporately because COVID has hit the staff here. And as we have walked through it the past couple of weeks, we are feeling better, but we wanted to adhere to CDC guidelines this week and just make sure that we were keeping everyone as safe as we could. We look forward to worshiping with you digitally this week and coming together again as a church body next week, September the 20th. So join us as Brandon leads us in worship today and as Pastor Mark uh, teaches us out of Mark chapter four. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again on our campus very, very soon. Good morning, church. Thank you so much for tuning in to worship this week. And also, thank you so much for your prayers for the staff. I think we are all across the board feeling better. So thank you so much for your prayers. Uh, let's begin with worship, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior standing, Standing on the promises of God. We can stand on the promises of God, and it's so good when we build our lives around Jesus, who is the cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less. Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name My hope is built My hope is built on nothing less then Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name Christ alone Christ alone Cornerstone Weak made strong in the Savior's love Through the storm He is Lord Lord of all When darkness seems When darkness seems To hide His face I rest on His unchanging grace In every high in every high and stormy gale My anchor holds, my anchor holds within 
my anchor holds my anchor holds within the veil Christ alone Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm He is Lord Lord of all When He shall come with trumpet sound Oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Christ alone Cornerstone Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone. Christ alone. Cornerstone. The weak made strong in the Savior's love. Also, our living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us! How high the mountain I could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the work is finished the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of angels. Step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation. 
salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on. Let's sing that again. Then came the morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is a victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the one who said. lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope hallelujah hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope Jesus Christ my living hope oh God you are my living hope he's our living sing that chorus one more time hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you Jesus have broken every chain and there's salvation in only your name Jesus Christ our living hope let's sing that one last time hallelujah Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our living hope. Lord, you died on a cross for us. You gave your life so that we could live and be free from sin, death, and hell. So, Lord, this morning I pray that you would help us to listen to you, Lord, and to stand firm on the promises that you've made to us since the beginning of time. Lord, we love you, and I pray that you would protect us as a church, help us to prepare for the day when we come back, Lord willing, next week to be together and worship you as your family. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name that I pray all this. Amen.
Hi, church family. Pastor Mark here. Good morning. I wish we could be together in the sanctuary at Broadway, but because we can't, we're thankful that we can join together, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or our webpage. We're glad that we can take the Word of God and open it together, and I hope you'll do that with us now. Take your Bible, turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. You know, we have been going through the Gospel of Mark now for five weeks, and we've entitled the series, Why Do We Call It the Good News? And every week, the title of the message asks a question, and that question is meant to focus us on why it's good news, why we call it the Gospel. Today, the question is, do you hear Him? Do you hear Him? From Mark chapter 4. You know, when I was at my last church, we were in the hurricane zone. And so often when the city of Houston had to evacuate due to hurricanes, they would come to our city. And our church was actually a Red Cross evacuation center where we would house people during hurricanes. That was interesting in and of itself. What always amazed me, though, is that you could have two different people who heard the exact same message about the hurricane. They heard the exact same warnings. They heard the exact same officials say to them, you need to leave. And one person might actually listen to what they heard and make immediate preparations. The other person, though, it was like they could care less. They heard it. They just didn't do anything about it. Well, you know, in the exact same way that people could respond to a message like a hurricane warning is the way people respond to the gospel. All my life, I've seen this happen, and you probably have as well, where we've been in a church, we've sat under the Word of God, and maybe there were two people, and one responded positively to the message and the Word that was preached, and the other could care less. Why is that? Why does one seem to respond and the other doesn't seem to respond at all, and yet they both heard the same message. Well, that's exactly what Jesus is driving at today. Can you really hear? I mean, maybe everybody hears audibly, but are you really receiving what the Lord is saying? And if you understand the gospel, you will receive what the Lord is saying. Well, there's two questions that I want to just pose to you in our text today. And the two questions are this. Number one, how do you hear the gospel? Now, what we're going to see is that everywhere that the gospel goes out, people hear. The question is, how do you hear the gospel? Now, the second question that we're going to look at in the text today is, how do you apply the gospel? You see, the second question builds on the first. If you hear the gospel and you truly hear it, then naturally it follows that you would be more than a hearer of the word. You would be a doer of the word. And so the question then is posed to us, well, how do we apply what we've heard? Well, both of those questions are dealt with and answered in this text. So let's open the text. Let's unpack those questions together. Number one, how do you hear the gospel? Now, here's a beautiful truth that we see in this parable where Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God. And the truth is this, that the gospel on this side of eternity is always available. It's always available. In other words, it's never going to run out. It's never going to stop. It's never going to be irrelevant for our day or our age. It's always available. And the reason it's always available because there's always a sower and there's always going to be the seed. Now, just look, if you will, what Jesus says in verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 3. He says, listen, behold, a sower went to sow. Now, he's starting to tell this story about how the kingdom of God is going to be received and how the kingdom of God is going to go forth. And he says, a sower went to sow. Now, he's going to later say, I'm the sower, but also anybody that goes in his name, anybody in the body of Christ, anybody that is his representative is also that sower. So there's always going to be a sower this side of eternity. 
And not only is there going to be a sower, but the sower is casting out something that has power, the word of God. Look at verse 14. He says, the sower sows the word. So look, here's the truth. There's always going to be a sower. There's always going to be the word. It's always going to be scattered. It's available. Now, that doesn't mean that it's everywhere all the time. I mean, we have to take the word and we have to go and we have to scatter the seed, but the word is always available and it's not going to stop at any time or in any season and it's going to just continue advancing. This is how it's going to work and the gospel is going to be available for everybody to hear. But here's the other truth that we see. Not only is the gospel available, and it is, but we are responsible in how we hear that gospel. Now remember, the question is, how do you hear the gospel? Well, the gospel is always available, so it's not hiding. You don't have to wonder, is the message going to be out there? It's going to be out there all over the world in some shape or form or, or ministry or mission. Word's going to be scattered. But the question is, how do we hear it? Now, there are four different types of hearts that Jesus points out in this passage. And each heart is a different way people hear the gospel. Now, just notice these four different types of people. They have always existed as long as the gospel started being scattered. And they will always exist until Jesus comes. You're going to respond to this gospel in one of four ways. You're going to hear it in one of four ways. Now look, if you will, at the very first way, verse four. This is what I like to call the stubborn, sinful heart right here. Verse four, it says, as it happened, as he sowed, that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Now we know in his telling later of the parable, this seed falls on hard soil. I mean, it's, it's so hard because it's been just compacted that it's like clay or it's like cement. Uh, back in Texas, my front yard, the yard was so hard. It was what they called post oak soil. And literally you could take a shovel and you could just slam it into the dirt. And I remember I had a friend come down from Mississippi and he said, are you sure that when they built your house, they didn't mix concrete in your front yard dirt. That's how hard the soil was. It was hard. You couldn't plant anything on it. You know, that hard soil, that clay that just hardened with the sun is, is the same type of path, heart, that Jesus is talking about here in verse 4. There's some people that when they hear the word of God, there's not anything deficient in the word. There's not anything deficient in the one who's sowing and teaching and preaching the word. The problem is their heart. They have become so hardened to God that they just become deeper and deeper in sin and it just sears their conscience, hardens their hearts and just compacts their hearts so that when the word is sown, it just sits there on the top. It doesn't even go in or penetrate. And it makes it that much easier for the devil, who is that bird in the story, to swoop down and take the seed that's already been sown. Now look, these people, they're stubborn, they love their sin, and they're so stubborn and so sinful that they don't want to let the Word of God penetrate their heart. I hope none of us are like that. But the truth is, there are going to be people just like that every time we preach and teach the Word of God. The seed is going to go forth. There's nothing deficient in the seed. The sower is going to give it. There's nothing deficient in the sower. The problem is the way that person hears and responds to the word of God. They're hard-hearted. They're sinful. Look at the second person, how they respond. This is what I call the selfish person. The selfish person. Um, look at verse 5. Some, see, some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, 
it withered away. Now, why would I call this selfish? Well, because what Jesus explains later when he goes back and he lays open this parable is these people here in this second category, they look like they have really embraced the gospel. But the minute two things come up, and I just want you to notice what those two things are. Look at verse 17 particularly. He says, and they have no root in themselves, and so only endure for a time. And afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble, they fall away. Now, notice those two key words in verse 17. Tribulation, persecution, when those two things arise in this person's life, it causes that person to fall away from the gospel. Now, this is why I call them selfish, okay? Because honestly, they came to the gospel more than likely for what they could get out of it. But the moment that things don't go the way they planned, the moment that God doesn't do everything for them that they wanted him to do, the moment that there's any tribulation or any persecution or anything not rosy in their Christian walk, they fall away because they say, this is not what I signed up for, right? I mean, I became a Christian. I embraced this seed of the word of God because, hey, it sounded really good to me. And I thought it could do a lot of good things for me. But instead, I'm realizing that it might actually bring, bring persecution. The word of God brings persecution. That's what it says in verse 17. And so I don't want that. And so what does the scripture say? Immediately, they stumble. They literally stumble over the word. They stumble over the gospel. They fall away. You see, these are people that hear the word. They receive it with joy at first. That sounds great. But then when they realize, hey, there's life to be lived and everything's not going to always be perfect and God didn't promise me all that I wanted or dreamed of, then they fall away. There's going to be people that hear the gospel and that's the way they're going to respond. That's the second group, what I call the selfish. Look at the third group that Jesus points out. He points out these, this group in verse 7. Some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Now, what are the, the, what are the, the, the ones of the thorns? We'll look at verse 18. He explains it. Now, these are the ones sown among the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. In other words, these people become distracted, okay? The seed of the word of God is given. The sower sows it. They hear it, but how do they respond? Remember, the whole question in this first point, how do you hear the gospel? How do they hear it? Well, they hear it in a distracted way. I mean, they hear it, but they let everything else distract them from the truth of the gospel, so there's people that are sitting in church that are, that are guilty of all three of these that we've covered so far. I mean, you can sit in church and your heart can be just like that first person, so hardened to the gospel that you would think this is for everybody else, but it's not for me. I hope everybody else is listening, but it's not for me. And your conscience and your heart has become hard. Or you're like the second person. You've, you've come and you've heard the gospel and you've said, that sounds so good. And as long as God meets his end of the bargain and the deal, I'm good too. But the minute persecution comes, I'm out. I didn't sign up for this. I didn't plan for this. The third group, distracted. I mean, you can come and you can say, oh yeah, the gospel, that sounds great. And yet become so distracted with your hobbies and sports and recreation and money and world to where it just chokes it out, right? There's nothing left because we have become so distracted and we've let so many things crowd in and distract. It's like we can't hear. We can't hear when the word is preached and proclaimed. But look at the fourth person, the fourth type of hearer. And this is the receptive person. So you have the stubborn, the selfish, the distracted, the receptive, the receptive person. Look at verse eight. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up and increased and produced some 30 fold, some 60 and some 100. 
Jesus explains in verse 20 what those people are. These are the ones sown on good ground who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. I mean, that's ultimately what we want to be, right? So we want to be those people that when the word is proclaimed, we actually hear it, we respond to it, our hearts are softened to receive the word of God, that seed that's sown. So let me just stop and ask this question right now. How do we hear the word of God? I mean, we all need to ask that question of ourselves. How do we hear the word of God? If we were to put ourselves in one of these categories, because we're all, no matter who we are, saved, unsaved, church member, non-church member, believer, unbeliever, we're all in one of these categories. We all are hearing the gospel in one of these ways. We're either stubborn and selfish, or we're distracted, or we're receptive. So which is it? Well, only you and the Lord know the answer to that. But hopefully, we're receptive, right? So my encouragement to you would be to continue to pray that your heart would be receptive to the Word of God when it's proclaimed. You know, that's one of the things that often I'll do for um, my own self. I'll say, Lord, would you please uh, just soften my heart so that when I hear your Word, when I read it, that it takes root and that there is fruit produced by your grace. You know, I pray that over my children. I pray when they hear the word of God that it takes root in their heart. And we ought to pray that for ourselves, for our children, our grandchildren, our church members, for people that we're sharing the gospel with. Because the reality is there's four different ways you could respond to the gospel every time you hear it. And I want you to notice this. Out of the four ways, three are negative and only one is positive. Have you ever wondered why people just don't come to Christ in mass all the time? Why people just don't constantly come to Christ and the gospel, even though the word is preached over and over again in so many different ways? Well, the answer is Jesus said this to his disciples that he was about to send out. He said it to you and I. He said, look, I mean, he didn't give a ratio, but he's saying, look, four times the gospel is preached, four different types of people, only one out of four is going to respond positively. Just let that sink in. Let that sink in. Not everybody is going to respond in the right way, but that's not our responsibility, is it? I mean, if we're called by God to be a sower, we go sow. We trust that the seed of the word of God is powerful. There's nothing ineffective in it. And we just let the word of God do its work. The question for ourselves, though, how are we hearing the gospel? Which one of these people are we? Well, let's move on to number two. And let's ask this question. Not only should we ask, how do we hear the gospel? And we know that there's four different ways we can hear the gospel. But secondly, how do we apply the gospel? So we know how we'll, we, we could potentially be hearing it. How do we apply the gospel? Now, notice after Jesus tells this parable, in verse 9, he says this. He said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, you know what's interesting to me when you read this parable and the parables that follow in the gospel is that often Jesus is going to start teaching parables. And what is a parable? Well, it's simply a story, an illustration from real life. You're not supposed to find a kernel of truth in every little detail of the parable. Uh, usually the parable just makes one overarching point. And uh, you get the point if you read it, it, it becomes pretty clear. But it's just an illustration to make a theological point or truth. And um, what you notice is that it's at this point in the Gospels that Jesus begins teaching in parables. Now, go back with me just a little bit. At the very beginning of the Gospels, and you see this particularly like in Matthew more so. Now, Mark is more condensed so you don't see it as much. But Jesus doesn't start out teaching in parables. 
I mean, remember the Sermon on the Mount? I mean, he was very, very clear in the Sermon on the Mount. There were no parables. He preached a sermon, and it was just as clear as day, right? But then suddenly, about Matthew chapter 13, and right here in Mark chapter 4, Mark's more condensed, so it's earlier in Mark, you start to see Jesus starting to use these parables. And here's another thing that's really interesting about those parables. He'll teach the public a parable, and he won't explain to the public what the parable means. Now, that's odd, because, you know, like right here, I mean, he had a great crowd with him. Look back at verse 1. And he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat, and he sat in it on the sea, and the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea, and then he taught them many things by parables. Do you see that? So he's got one of the largest crowds he's ever had. And yet he's going to start teaching by parables. And, and go back and look at verse 8 and 9. He never explains this parable to the crowd. He simply ends the story, verse 9, saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now go to verse 10. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. In other words, they said, hey, why did you teach in a parable and not explain that parable to all the people that were listening? Well, let me just explain what's happening here in the life and ministry of Jesus. Up until this point, Jesus has been extremely clear, extremely clear in his preaching, extremely clear in his message. But if you're following along in Mark, then you know that chapter 4 follows chapter 3, where people begin to accuse Jesus of being the devil. I mean, something shifts when people begin accusing him of being Beelzebub, and they begin saying, you're mad. And they begin coming after him and saying, listen, we don't think that what you're doing is right. What Jesus begins to do is he begins to actually conceal the truth from the masses. Now, he's not trying to confuse them. I mean, he's certainly inviting them. You see it right there in verse 9. If you want to know more about this, if you have ears to hear, hear it, right? I'm available. He gives an invitation, and that invitation is in verse 9. But what he's doing, and more so, this is going to happen more and more as he goes closer to the cross, more and more the Jewish religious leaders have openly rejected Christ. More and more the people have openly rejected Christ. He has thrown the seed out there over and over again. Their hearts have become so hard, so hard, so hard. They've just rejected, 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 rejected. And now, instead of grace, they're actually getting judgment. And part of their judgment is a parable. They're not getting the whole story. They're not getting the whole truth. They're being invited to learn more. But Jesus isn't just going to keep giving it out there. Now, this is partial judgment, but it's also mercy because God knows that if he continues to give them the truth and preach truth to them and they just continue to reject it and continue to reject it, then at the judgment seat, they're going to have to answer for that. So this is his mercy, but it's also his judgment. But notice that there is an invitation there. He says, look, if you really want to know the truth that I'm teaching, I'll be happy to explain it if you come to me. And notice verse 10, when he was alone, those around him. In other words, those that stayed, those who didn't just walk off when it was finished, those who stayed around and the 12 said, explain it to us. They asked him about the parable. And he said to you, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables. So that, and he quotes Isaiah, seeing they may see uh, and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. You know, in other words, he says, look, the invitation is there, but in order to understand what I'm preaching and teaching, there's got to be illumination illumination. There's the invitation, but people aren't going to understand who don't belong to Christ, aren't one of his own, aren't in the kingdom of God. You know, 
that's true for us as well, right? I mean, the truth is the gospel goes forth and yet the New Testament tells us that there are people who hear the same message you and I may hear and it means nothing to them. You know, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who do not believe. You know that the things of God are spiritually discerned. Uh, Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that um, those without the spirit, they cannot understand the things of God. We're told in scripture that the God of this world, the devil, has blinded their eyes and, and confused them to truth. And so all of this is true. I mean, unless we have the Holy Spirit of God living in us, unless we belong to God and are in the kingdom of God, we see the cross as foolishness. We do not perceive the deep things of God because we don't have the Spirit of God to teach us. And Satan has blinded our eyes. If we're not part of Christ, then we can't understand those truths. And in the same way, it was true then as well. If they were not following Christ, being obedient to Christ, responding to the light of Christ, then you know what? They were not understanding and receiving even though they were hearing. You know, so it's kind of like this. This is a deep truth, but I used to have a uh, Bible professor and he told this story. He said, you know, when you come in contact with God's word, it's like you're in a cave. So imagine you're in this dark cave. And on one side, you can see a very small, faint circle of light. And you know that if you go in that direction, that you are going to go toward the light, out of the cave, and each step that you make, that little bitty light that you see is going to get larger and larger and larger until eventually you step into the light and you're surrounded by the light. But the opposite is also true. On this side of you, there is no light, and it's just deeper and deeper and deeper into the cave. Well, the professor said that's the way it is with biblical truth. I mean, when we're confronted with biblical truth, we can do one of two things. We can either walk toward the light of the gospel. And if we will walk toward the light of the gospel, the more we go toward the truth, the brighter and more clear it becomes. The Spirit illuminates our mind, our thinking, our heart, and it just becomes more clear and more, uh, more sweet, uh, more enriching as we walk towards Christ, the cross, the truth, the Word. But the opposite's also true. We can just walk away from that. The more we walk away, the smaller the light becomes, the more our consciences are dulled and seared, according to the New Testament, and the farther away we get away from the light of Christ, right? So an unbeliever loves darkness. They don't like the light. They want to run from the light. An unbeliever doesn't want to apply the word of God at all. An unbeliever is very happy to just let the seed of the word of God fall on them, and either they have that hardened sinful heart or that selfish heart, they're only in it for themselves, or that distracted heart, and they're not interested in really applying the word of God at all. A believer, though, can't live that way, right? I mean, they want the seed of the word of God to fall. They want it to fall in the right place in their heart, and they want God to produce in them spiritual fruit. They want to grow. They're hungry for God's truth. And friends, if we do not have a desire to apply the Bible, to our life, to take that seed of the word of God and see the Lord do good things in us, then something's wrong, right? Because Christ gives the invitation. If you want to learn more, I'll teach you more. And he also gives illumination to his people. He gives the invitation and those who are are truly his respond. They have ears to hear. And he gives illumination. Those who belong to him They grow in the knowledge of the Lord, in the wisdom and the knowledge of the Lord. They they are illuminated by the scripture, by the truth, by the Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus is ultimately saying here to these people. He's saying, look, you're all going to hear the gospel. The question is, are you going to apply the gospel? And 
truthfully, true believers will certainly do that. They will apply the gospel. Well, our prayer as your pastors is that the word of God is taking root in your heart as you study it, as you hear it, as it's preached, as we live it together, and that we're not just hearing it, but we're saying, Lord, apply it, right? I mean, the Holy Spirit is working on us and producing in us spiritual fruit that makes us different people. And it ought to be our prayer that as long as we're under the word, that we're constantly changing and becoming different people. A Christian is not somebody who just comes and sits and listens. A Christian is somebody who is challenged by the word of God. And they know as long as God has me on this earth, no matter how old he may allow me to, to, to live on this earth or how long he may keep me, he has me here to continue to grow me into his likeness. And that's what I want to do. I want to be obedient to do that until he takes me home. I hope that's your prayer. I hope that's your life. I hope that's your experience. Well, thank you for letting us bring the word of God to you today. We hope that it's been a blessing. We're praying that you'll grow spiritually because of the word that's been cast out today. We can't wait to see you again, hopefully, as we come back together at Broadway Baptist Church. God bless you. Have a great day.